Everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. That is so much better. Yes. Okay. Welcome everyone to our session, Elevating the Voices of the Voiceless. This session will be an hour long. If you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A. Both myself and Lainey Myers are with Utah's Office of Homeless Services. We will be monitoring the Q&A to answer any logistical questions that come up. Questions for presenters will be answered time permitting. So to start things off, we would like to take a moment to honor all those who are homeless and formerly homeless that have had their voices taken from them. We will continue to work harder to honor their lives and not diminish their voices. And now a woman who needs no introduction because she has been a fierce advocate for our homeless neighbors for decades, Ms. Pamela Atkinson. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Carol, and welcome everybody. Um, we've got some excellent panelists here today. And it's, the goal is actually to listen to the panelists and then we can decide what it is we need to do to answer those questions that the panelists have described to you through their lived experiences. Um, we need to um, first understand the importance of including our homeless friends and their lived experience into the initiatives that we're all working on to build community support it's necessary to include these households into all conversations that educate the greater community on issues. Um, when you hear these panelists talking and you, you, you'll hear, well, that makes a lot of sense because a great deal of it is basic common sense. I, I want to just say uh, uh, it, it, in a few minutes, to talk about the importance of the art of listening. And that includes listening to everybody. I want to say the next step is understanding what people are talking about. I cannot even begin to describe how much I have learned from my homeless friends over the years. It's been incredible. They've helped me to look at life in a different way. They've helped me to know what questions to ask. And one of the most important questions, of course, is what do you need? Not what I think they need. And so through this discussion in this hour, I hope you will um, all get a sense of what our panelists who have lived homelessness are going to say to you and how you can help. So without further ado, um, this is just the beginning of conversations because we hope what comes out, out of here is that we will continue to change and to be more inclusive of the necessary voices. So all voices are important and homeless people, their voices are as important as my voice and, and your voice and then put them all together and start listening to one another. So. I just want the um, panelists to briefly introduce themselves in terms of the, where they're from and when were they were homeless and where are you now in, in, in life. Um, so let me start with you, Shaley, please. Yes, um, my name is Shaley Ovar, and I first became homeless back in April of 2016. Um, we, our furnace had gone out. Uh, it was going to cost a lot of money to fix, so we were using space heaters to keep warm. Uh, our electricity bill went up during the middle of winter, and at that point, we had to make a decision, do we pay our rent or do we pay our power bill so that my children stay warm? We chose our power bill not knowing that it was going to create issues with our rent because they would not accept partial payments. One month became two, and then eventually we were evicted. 
and I was homeless for about five years, lived with my grandmother for about three more years before I finally was able to get out on my own. Thank you, uh, Shady. That's a nice synopsis and we'll hear more from you um, in a while. Jack, could you make a brief statement about you and your experience, please? I don't know how to. How I to think yes, go ahead. We can hear you. Okay. Well, uh, my name is Jack Nelson, and I've been homeless since uh, 2013. I'm not homeless at this point, uh, but I was uh, working a job, and we, we were buying a house, had been for 10 years, and uh, came up with a health issue that uh, I was able to get resolved, but uh, my work had told me that I was welcome back uh, as soon as I was well. And when I went back, they fired me for medical reasons. And by then my house had fallen into, you know, uh, foreclosure, so to speak. And I couldn't, no way to catch it up. So we ended up losing our house and living in a small camp trailer for about two years bouncing around from place to place because there was no zoning for it anywhere where we were at down in Southern Utah. And uh, I was too young still to collect social security. So we, we finally got to the point where we couldn't stay down there, moved up to Salt Lake at the invitation of a friend, but soon had to get out of there because she was an alcoholic and we had got to the point where we were having a lot of trouble uh, being there. So we moved in with some other acquaintances and it was very tense, uh, you know, getting along with other people that have different lifestyles, different political points of view and, and they have the remote control and that kind of stuff. And uh, that was very tense. And during this time we were looking for housing and trying to get it through the social system to get us some help. And I got so distraught that I was really, I became suicidal. I, I could just see us living in a ditch, looming on the horizon. And I ended up at a library trying to, to apply for a job and the librarian saw how distraught I was, hooked me up with Volunteers of America and they sent me to the Four Street Clinic. And the Four Street Clinic, I finally saw a psychologist and got a little bit of help with my medication. And that turned out to be being introduced to uh, a person in in uh, the social services that helped me find a home, uh, helped us get housing. That whole process uh, of trying to find housing to me was very, very difficult. I, I really couldn't figure out how to deal with it. And every attempt I made made me more confused and more angry. And uh, if I hadn't found the right person in the social services, they could take my case and go through it step by step and and do it, you know, I, without me really, except for I'd sign the papers, we, we still, we would be in the ditch. Right now we're happily in housing out in Magna. And I'm really thankful that that has happened. It's made all the difference in the world. Thank you, thank you, Jack. That's um, very, very good to give us an understanding. And as we listen, uh, you know, to, to you and Shaley, um, I think people are going to see the commonalities that run through your stories, the the small things that can happen, um, being short one, being short of rent, um, not being able to find the right type of help that you need. And so uh, for one more uh, perspective on this, uh, Brian, uh, we'd love to hear what you have to say, please. Brian Higgins. Hello, everyone. Um, honored to be here. It's great to be able to, to give back to the community through my personal experience. Uh, I found that, you know, one of the most beneficial things that I can do is to be, you know, to, to be open and honest and uh, about my story, you know, so that others can see um, maybe that there is a light at the end of their tunnel because uh, my tunnel was certainly um, you know, very long and, and dark. And I, I wanna make sure that, that people can see that there is a way out. So um, my experience with homelessness began actually, it was 10 years ago last week. 
um, it, it popped up. It was the the magic of of Facebook memories that 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 it popped up and and reminded me that um, that it, it my ten year anniversary. Um, but basically, my story is specifically from from mental health. You know, I, I had a lot of conflict based um, PTSD um, from a veteran aspect. And it, it, it was certainly untreated because I couldn't find, you know, treatment that that would resonate with me. So I, I did a lot of uh, self medication through uh, alcohol and, and, and other substances, uh, which, which in my in my case was was trying to make my problems go away but it didn't make my problems go away. It just made everybody else go away. It made my entire life go away. And that's how I ended up. I, I found myself, found myself living um, on, on the streets in Salt Lake. Um, my experience of homelessness lasted around about 18 months to two years uh, to really, to really get back. But, but I was in and out of uh, different shelters, different, um, uh, different facilities. Um, I was able to, when I could get a friend to let me stay on, on the couch for a little bit um, here and there. And then, and, and there were many nights actually living, you know, in, a, in makeshift uh, tents. So, um, and it, you know, it took a long time. It, it, I found it was very, it was very easy for me to become homeless, but I had a very difficult time coming out of it until I started learning to, to ask the two most difficult questions, which is, I don't know, and I need help because I certainly did not know, you know, and, and I, I definitely needed help. And when people were there to answer those questions, uh, and, and more importantly, when I was able to accept people's help, you know, when people could actually look me in the eye and not treat me uh, as I was invisible and, and some, someone to be scared of, uh, that's when things started changing for me. And I was able to get myself into, into different programs um, you know, offered by different facilities, but then also, also offered within the community and volunteer based. And I was able to get myself back into, you know, uh, established housing. And then over the course of time, get myself back into, into the workplace. And, and I was able to buy a house and refurbish it uh, two years ago as well. So it, it's been a long old journey, but um, I certainly didn't do it alone. I uh, had a lot of help from, from the ground up. So it, it's great to be here and I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Oh, thank you. Uh, we appreciate that. You, you, you see yourself as a creative ima imagineer and mental health advocate, is that correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah I ended up, I, I, I've started my own little nonprofit, you know, based on my experience to try to bring my story to others and help mm -hmm. other people tell their story from a, an emotional standpoint. Um, because we can always connect through emotional storytelling. Uh, we may not be able to connect through experiential, you know, but yeah. when we can break things down to the emotional standpoint, everybody has experienced pain, anger, fear, and uh, we wanna be able to, to, to help people get through those. Thank you, Brian. I wanted people to understand what it is you do, and that's a that's a great uh, explanation. And our um, final pan panelist for introduction is Commissioner Amelia Gardner. Um, if you'd like to um, share uh, just a short introduction, please. Welcome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was having some technical difficulties. Thank you for, uh, for bearing with me on that. My name is Amelia Powers Gardner. I am a commissioner in Utah County, one of three commissioners um, to serve the county. And uh, my background is I, I experienced homelessness as a child. Um, when I was in second grade, my mom graduated from college and was able to get a full-time job. And when that happened, she lost a lot of her government subsidies. So that's what's commonly known as the welfare cliff. And I think my experience is a good one to show that many of the people experiencing homelessness are not what a lot of people think. Um, 
these are hardworking people who find themselves in a tough situation. And with my, in, with my family's case, my mother had just graduated from college, uh, had just lost government subsidies, and therefore we had lost government housing, but she didn't quite make enough money yet to afford a house for our family. And so we experienced homelessness in a different way where we, we put all of our belongings in a storage unit and then we lived in people's houses. We lived our whole family in one bedroom or um, there were times that we would rent a motel for a week uh, or we would use somebody's camp trailer behind their house or we would sleep in a friend's living room. And so we really were like the couch surfing family for a while until my mom was able to get to a point that she could secure housing for us. Okay, well, well, thank you. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to, to join us. Um, let's, um, um, I, I personally have not been homeless, near homeless. I grew up in the, the um, in close to the slums in, in Southeast uh, London, one of those houses, uh, rat infested and mice, and, and uh, one of those houses with insufficient room insufficient uh, food and everything. So um, no indoor uh, toilet, a little toilet outside. So we didn't have a real uh, bathroom. Um, but as I reflect on those throughout my life, I find I don't define myself by what happened when I was young and what have you, but I define myself by what I am now. And I see a lot of that in our panelists, defining themselves as to who they are now, not defining themselves as to when they were homeless, but having learned from that, that homelessness. So um, as you've worked with uh, service providers, can you tell us what it was like uh, trying to get people to understand what your needs were um, you, you know, you can say whether it was easy or, or difficult or safe, chaotic. Keeping in mind that case managers have some of the toughest jobs and some uh, right now, of course, they're, they're, they're overwhelmed and they're over, understaffed and um, there's a high amount of stress and they don't always have, have the time to spend the sufficient time to give to, to our homeless friends, but speak from your own personal experience, please, so that we can learn from, from what, what you have experienced with, with uh, the, your case managers and, and your providers. And uh, Brian, let's start with you, please. Um. I had a difficult time with, with trust in, in even accessing uh, a case manager because of the difficulty I, I had experienced in my you know, personal life and the way the public had sort of treated me and, and the media. There was a lot of fear based around um, my experience and people were, were scared of how I would react. You know, it was a... It was a um, it, you know, a, a dangerous aspect for a lot of people. So, so a lot of people had shunned me. And, and as I mentioned, you know, I, I really felt invisible and was pretty isolated. So my, my trust in accessing the help that was offered to me uh, was, was non-existent. And things had to get, you know, devastatingly terrible for me to, as I mentioned in my introduction, was to actually ask for help and then accept it. And I know that it is difficult because everybody is is overrun. The 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 work schedule is is very tough, and to be able to get in with someone, I did feel that there was a lot of benefit with the genuine few initial minutes that I could sit with somebody and feel that they were listening to me, you know, and they would hear my story and whether or not they could, you know, connect with it or have empathy, they would, they would still have an idea and an answer for me to move forward. 
you know, to give me the next step in my path, you know, to move me on to the next program, the next, the next person, the next shelter uh, that, that I could possibly find the answers. And, and that was what I found very beneficial was, was understanding that not everybody has the exact answers, but they will have, you know, the next step in mm -hmm. piece of the puzzle so that you can move forward because it is a long journey. You know, it's, it's not a mathematical question where two plus two equals four, you know, um, it's, it's just, it's just different ways to try to find the help that you need. But again, it was mostly me being finally willing to accept the help that was given to me. Uh, and the, the help was there, you know, I just, I just had to accept it. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's really very helpful. And, and Jack, can you relate at all to what Brian has just talked about and how was your experience uh, different in terms of providers and interactions? Well, I, I think he's right on and he, he says that uh, he got downtrodden by the experience. And uh, in my case, uh, just about everything was related to, to the homelessness aspect, not having a place to actually live and feel, you know, kick back and feel comfortable. Uh, not being able to take a bath, you know, I mean, being able to take a bath and stuff like that. But uh, when I tried to seek help, when I went to the places and applied for, for housing, it was, there was a, a two and a half year waiting list on everything. And then they would send me to another place to apply. And it was like being sent over to fill out another identical set of, of applications was still a two to two and a half year waiting list for our situation and people in the waiting room, a full waiting room. And, and, you know, I got the feeling that the people that were working there were well-meaning, but like you say, they were completely uh, overwhelmed by what was going on and really unable to do much more than give you a form to fill out and tell you to wait in line. And that went on until seriously, I, I became you know, I would say that I became <laughs> deranged in a way. And, uh, and like I said, a librarian noticed it, put me in touch with, with uh, people that sent me to the clinic and it was being treated for my, you know, mm -hmm. my nut nuttiness and getting on medication and seeing a so psychologist. It was eventually the psychologist that understood what I really needed. And, and put me in touch with somebody who really knew how to do it. But it, it took me years to go through this process and I was stressed the entire time. And I have to say that even though I'm in housing now and I really like it and things have really turned around for me, I still can't shake the feeling that things are gonna turn around and I'm gonna, it's all gonna fall apart. And, and so I'm stuck with this, this uh, lingering anxiety about it all, about homelessness. And I feel for the homeless. And that's one of the reasons why I wanna, wanna mm -hmm. take part in this. Um, I think it's important for people to know. Uh, one more thing that I wanna say is, I think that homelessness or, or housing is at the center of, of the fix. I think that the society itself is basically not into having uh, you know, centers built in their neighborhoods and stuff like that. I think we're, we're in a community that, that thinks that you deserve what you, you get. And they look at people who are downtrodden as well. They aren't playing the game right. But I, I really think they're close to, to the edge and they, they don't realize it. When you once go over that edge, getting back up is very difficult. You, right. Everybody that tries to help you turns into a pirate. And, and steal yeah. from you, you know, uh, here, sure, I'll help you. And boom, there goes your stuff. You know, somebody takes what you've collected throughout your life. Well, you know, I lost all my stuff and maybe I'm better off, but, but uh, you know, really, uh, you, your friends are no longer really there. Uh, you know, you are a stranger in a strange land and scared and in need of help. 
and finding a system that gives you forms to fill out and send you down the road. And that is mm -hmm. the advice thing for that. Yeah, that, that, that's great. You've really illustrated a, a number of, of principles. Um, and again, you know, you're talking about trust and fear and, and listening much as um, uh, Brian articulated. Uh, Shaylee, um, what about your experience as compared to, to Jack's and Brian's? Yes, thank you, Pamela. Um, in my experience, it was very difficult for me to actually connect with a case manager. Um, and every time that I would go into the office area to try and receive help, I mean, you could just see how busy and overwhelmed they were. There were so many families and individuals seeking help all at the same time, all trying to escape homelessness, all trying to find a home of their own where they can be safe with their own families. And so you really get a good idea of how apparent that need is for case managers. I feel like if there were more um, avenues or maybe more case managers, that it would have been a lot easier for me to connect to the resources that I needed. In my journey, I um, was experiencing homelessness as well as experiencing substance abuse disorders. And uh, my real struggle came when um, I was actually kicked out of the shelter for paraphernalia that they had found um, that I had actually even forgotten I had in my luggage, um, which made it even harder for me because I went back out onto the street, sleeping under a bridge in the snow and not knowing where I was going to find a meal, not knowing who I could turn to, who I could talk to. And it was very difficult situation to be in um, when really all you're looking for is somebody to listen. Mm -hmm. when, when was this, um, Shaylee? Uh, this was over the course of uh, 2016 and um, all the way up until 2020 when I did find my own home finally. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, it's one of the awful things being homeless when you're you're out there and in the elements and um, you just feel so alone you just feel that nobody cares I, I think um, the outreach teams have have grown to the point that they're finding more people now than they were in 2016 and I'm sorry that our teams didn't find you when you needed people the most. But thank you for your resilience and courage. And um, Commissioner, what, what would you like to add to the conversation at this point? I'll just add that one of the issues for my family was that the offices that could offer help were open during business hours. And my mom was working two jobs. And so she had a really hard time accessing services for us as a family, because when she was available, everything was closed. And when they were available, she had to be at work so that she could get enough money to get us into housing. And so I think that's something to look at is that you've got some people that they're going to need services when it's not during business hours and then when it's not convenient. I, I think that's an excellent point. Um, and before the um, mini crisis we're in, in terms of op open positions, many uh, low income people were fired if they took time off during the day. They, they were told if they took time off, they couldn't come back, even if it was a sick kid or what have you. I, I think we're getting um, somewhat more sensitive to that now and different types of businesses and doctors and uh, clinics are open in, in the evening. Um, but I think we still have a, a, a long, long way to go. Um, yeah, especially when you talk about clinics, just like you said, my mom could never miss work to bring us to the doctor even. And so um, I remember being a little girl and my older siblings had to take school off to stay home with me when I was sick. And by the time my mom got off work, there were no doctors open because urgent mm -hmm. cares didn't exist, right? All right. Well, well said. 
And um, Jack, moving on to something uh, slightly different, what can you name an, an instance um, during your homeless days when a case manager or provided is something that you found um, very helpful? And then conversely, something that hurt you or was harmful? Uh, well, when I finally ran into, uh, I say the name, the person's name. I ran into yes. Kelly, Kelly Romer. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. Who works for aging and mm -hmm. adult services. Uh, put in touch with her by the psychologist I was seeing. And uh, she, you know, once we got, she actually took it by the reins and filled out the form for us. We sat in her office and she would ask us, what she needed to know. And she filled out all the forms and submitted them. And within within a month and a half, she had us looking at places that were nice. And we we found one within about two months and we moved into it and life's just been great compared to how it was. But prior to that, prior to all of that, it was, it was what I called uh, death by pretense to help. You know yeah. what I mean? It was just a, a chain of kind of like felt like disconjoined people who would give give you what they thought was good advice. Uh, you you call a you call a um, a suicide hotline, and they mm -hmm. say, "Oh yeah, we'll help you. Come in." You know, you go in there. They give you forms to fill out so that you can get Medicaid. You know, but if you don't have the pay, spend down. You can't get any help. And so you go to another one, another place, and you find out that, it, that they're kind of like a franchise. They're all run by the same people, and they all have the same situation. And none of them had anything to do with, with finding us housing. Housing was at the root of our problem. And by the time we got it, I had become psychologically problematic and living in fear for two years. And yeah. and mad and disgusted and you know i'm not that nice of a person to be around when i'm fed up with everything <laughs> you know what i mean it's I, i'm you know it's it's almost i can't imagine how it worked out that we actually got housing out of this and that it's worked out so well but i have to really thank kelly she's she's been wonderful well, I have to tell you, I'm uh, one of Kelly Roma's admirers. Uh, I think she's uh, she, her uh, title, I believe, is Director of Salt Lake County Aging Services. And she has really become such a strong proponent and advocate for services for older people who, who are homeless. And uh, she makes waves whenever it is necessary. And we listen very carefully to her because she's learn so much and she's very knowledgeable so thank you for that jack appreciate I think, that i i think that her method of approach should become the standard because it works i, I you know i'd love to see i'd love to see that instituted across the board if possible okay thank you jack that's a very helpful suggestion um shaley please so i think um <sighs> Because I didn't have very many interactions with the case managers, it's hard for me to pull a positive experience into it. Um, I would say probably one of the more hurtful things that happened to me was when I was released from the shelter and not able to go back because of um, the paraphernalia that they had found, which ultimately put me out on the street with nowhere to go and no one to turn to. And I fear that there's other people who are also struggling with an addiction and they're not getting the help that they need, but rather um, kind of shamed in a way by being forced to leave without being offered any kind of supportive services. Like, hey, if I get you in touch with this person, can you turn it around? Can you try? Will you try? Because I would have. Mm -hmm. And and the paraphernalia, the drug para paraphernalia, it you had 
put, had it in your luggage, but you certainly weren't using it in the shelter. And you weren't listened to, is that what you're saying? Right. Um, it was something that we had carried around because everything that we had left was in mm -hmm. one giant luggage suitcase and um, entering into there, um, you know, they had searched it and not found anything. So I never once thought that there was still something in there. Um, and so I wasn't using at the shelter. I was, you know, leaving, um, going and meeting and, and you know, never ever actually using in the shelter um, because there's children there and I would never right. ever try and put them in a situation that would compromise them. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like if somebody had just offered me some sort of resource or direction to go in, that, that would have been mm -hmm. far more beneficial for me. In other words, to have sat down with you and told you what your options were once you left the shelter. Is that's Absolutely. what you're asking? I, I think that's a, that's a great recommendation, and and thank you for sh for sharing that, Commissioner. You know, it's hard for me to answer that question because I was in second grade, yeah. and so I didn't really have a lot of the interaction. Okay. I just remember that, like I said, my family the, the only struggle they had was that my mom couldn't get there because of work. Uh, but beyond that, the community was very helpful to us. Okay, thank you, Brian. Yep. Um, you know, I find that when 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 certain case managers started trying to help me in a different way, because again, with my mental health issues and all the trust difficulties, which a lot of people have, um, when they started personalizing their interactions with me uh, to help to help me connect and realize that you know that 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 it was a good pathway to follow, and you know there was there was one specific fella um who i have you know I, I still thank him every every couple of weeks you know i'll i'll remember and i'll reach out just to say thank you how 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 well he helped me and he started using the the leap technique and leap um you know stands for l is uh, listen so he would listen to me um e would be to empathize to to connect with with the experience that i was having um, agree that that was, you know, a difficult situation um, because I always had, again, the trust issue of like that, you know, there, there might have been a level of, and in my mind, there was a level of, of tourism, you know, the case managers got to go on home to their, to their safety nets, um, whereas, whereas, whereas I didn't have my safety net. So, so to agree that there was the difficulty and then partner together so that we would come up with the the forward plan together. So again, that, that's the LEAP method, which is a listen, empathize, agree, and partner. And, and I, I thought that was the first time that somebody was really connecting with, with me as a, as, a, as a human being, rather than uh, I've just got to get through this next 10 minutes so I can tick this off my inbox to, to get on to the next person. And, you know, and that, and that really helped me with my with my self esteem right. to be able to, to move forward. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's, that's valuable uh, inf information. Uh, I think I, I got everybody on that question because the next one is uh, is very um, similar. Um, it, it, the question is, what do you wish a case manager had done to better serve you? And as I say, it's very closely related. And case managers in 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 the um, in the audience, please don't feel we're we're picking on you. But you play such an important, vital role. And as you can hear, it's been mixed experiences. And 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 as I referenced early, we know you're overworked, understaffed, and stressed. And so please keep that in mind. And what we're all saying here is, would this be helpful for you in the future and for the people in the higher positions who are making decisions about number of case managers per homeless uh, people, um, not looking at the multiplicity of problems that six homeless people might have 
and the one or two that the other six people might have. And it's, it's like scheduling staff in a hospital where you look at the severity of the illness to decide how many patients will be assigned to one nurse. And that's what we need to look at more. And the people making the decisions like in, in the legislature and the leaders have to look at what the needs are from your perspective, as well as from the providers and case managers expect, expectations. So let me ask you um, about that question then. What do you wish a case manager had done? Jack, let's start with you. Well, my, my thing is that people don't understand how distraught you become. And it, it just seems to me that it took to actually took me years of trying to actually get a case manager, which was Kelly. And after that, it became really good. But I was bouncing around from place to place, not really knowing where to go. And, and my anxiety got to the point with me where mm -hmm. it became yeah. deranging. And I think that that's what's happening to a lot of people. They're, I mean, the homelessness situation takes a toll on your mental, on your mental state, big time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Jack. Yeah. Commissioner. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I wish caseworkers uh, maybe would would know is that there was a lot of things that my family could have used help with that we didn't tell a caseworker because we were afraid that DCFS would take us from our mom, right? Like mm -hmm. we didn't tell the caseworker that when we had ear infections, we didn't go to the doctor because we could because the doctor wasn't open when our mom was there. Um, we could have used help, but we were too afraid that if we told them that our mom wasn't able to bring us to the doctor, that that the government would take us away. And so you've got to be able to create trust with your, uh, with the people you're serving, because um, if they know that you're going to have their best interest in mind and that you're not uh, going to tattletale on them, uh, they need real help and they're afraid to ask for it because they're afraid there may be consequences and developing the trust so that they know that they can tell you what they really need and you're not going to, um, you know, be a rat them out or tattletale on them. I think that will go a long way. Oh, I, I, I thank you for being so articulate about it. A trust, it, it is so important. Um, when you grow up, um, you know, in poverty, like I did, and you're talking about, um, you tend to have a very low self-esteem, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that happens is if you trust somebody and that trust is broken, it is absolutely devastating. Um, right. And one learns not to trust um, uh, very, very few people. And I, I think that um, the trust is so important. One of the most pleasant things I hear from my homeless friends, uh, um, you know, thank you for listening and I know you'll follow up and they'll say, I trust you, Pamela. Well, that phrase is going to make me follow up immediately if I, if I can, because okay. somebody's trust in me, and that trust is, is so valuable. And uh, that's when the relationship, I think, with the providers works, is when there's that mutual trust. So right. Brian, if, if, so, if you're I'm afraid sorry. to let people know what problems you have, they can't help you. So absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. You have to be very honest with the person who is trying to help you, because if you try and hide something, it's going to trip you up later, if not sooner. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Brian? Um, well, jumping off on that, you know, the, the honesty, again, because I, I would hide a lot of stuff because I was afraid um, of, of where it would get me. You know, I, I had had... Um, a lot of negative experiences and a lot of, you know, miscommunication aspects and um, getting myself placed into, you know, psych wards and things like that, where I, I maybe felt was a, was the wrong diagnosis. So, so I, I did, you know, really start communicating for what I, what I thought people wanted to hear, you know, in order to, to get, um, to get what I wanted. But, 
again, that was that wasn't really getting me anywhere. So, so again, learning to be totally accountable and totally honest, and and being prepared to take the steps forward, and and having somebody that would, you know, hold my hand through it, you know, uh, and and really help me and, and and show me the way. So. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, Shaylee. Um, I would say um, same along the lines with everyone else as far as listening is concerned. Um, I do wish that someone had sat down with me because I know they would have realized that I would have accepted help. Any help that they were able to give me, I would have accepted. I was so desperate at that time. And all I wanted was to be normal. I wished that I was other people because I didn't know how to live my life anymore. And I wish that somebody had sat down with me at that time and let me know what resources were available to me and let me know that I am not somebody to be ashamed of and that I'm not just another drug addict that I have two small children that depend on me and rely on me to be there for them. And if I cannot even be there for myself, it makes everything far more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, There's a follow-up question. How do you feel about yourself and your life now, Shaley? You know, I know that Everything I went through, I had to go through because I don't think I would have ever discovered my strength or ever have been able to get sober and have been sober for three years now. Um, I'm really grateful for the entire experience, regardless of whether I received help in time or, or something that could have made my length of, of homelessness shorter. I know and understand that all of that had a purpose in my life. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Commissioner, what do you feel we could do better in terms of relationships between our homeless friends and the providers from your perspective? You know, I think one of the, one of the great things we could do um, is I think our providers can help other people in the community recognize the human aspect of this, just like Shaylee was talking about, um, that a lot of people in the community um, see homeless people as either an, just another drug addict or, you know, as was mentioned earlier, maybe it's because they deserve this because they haven't worked hard. And then that reflects on the way you view yourself. Yeah. And I think the relationship between uh, the those that are here to help the community is to help them with the human aspect that you matter that you as an individual are a child of God and that matters and that people care about you and even if by people we just mean the caseworker right that you are cared about that you matter and that you have value merely by existing and we want to recognize that and help people know that they have dignity and then we as individuals who recognize that ourselves need to help other people in the community recognize that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's what, very well said, thank you. I, um, so, well, I sometimes get talking to um, homeless uh, people and then particularly if it's a family, um, I always go and find their case manager and <clears throat> let them know uh, how I'm involved and if I met them at the soup kitchen or what. But I always find out um, if it's all right with the case manager. I would never go around a case manager. And I know some of our, our, our public well-meaning friends do try uh, to help a family. But I think you, if you're helping, then one needs to work closely with the case manager. Um, not so long ago, I was at the Wigan Center and I sat down with a, with a homeless friend who um, I hadn't seen for a while. And he said, do you have time to talk? And I said, sure. Well, I found I had time to listen because eventually he stopped talking and he said, 
nobody has ever listened to me for 45 minutes, Pamela. And I said, well, how do you know it's 45 minutes? He said, there's a clock behind you. And he said, you've listened for 45 minutes. He said, I, I wish other people would listen for 45 minutes. And so, you know, I explained I was a volunteer. And so I had control over my time to a certain extent. Um, and that case managers may have 20 different individuals or families. And, and I, I think, um, you know, the art of listening has been fading away over the years. It's, it's, it's not just our homeless population. It's become so diverse, di divisive around that we've lost that art in, in many ways. But the listening and the understanding, I mean, we're understanding what you're saying today. And we know we can't go back and make it better for you right now. But know that we love you and appreciate you for your resilience and your courage and where you've come from and where you are now. And so, you know, this is a defining moment. You're sharing something so very personal, something that is so hurtful that has happened in your past. And then you, I look at what your lives are right now and, and let me tell you, my respect and admiration for all four of you is, is just great. And I hope that our listeners have um, taken this in the spirit in, in, in which it was given. Um, I, I know we're getting a little short on time. Do, um, should we um, go to questions at this point, Carol? I believe Carol's having some technical difficulties, um, but I can take over. This is Lainey. Yes, Lainey. Um, let's go ahead. Yeah, we can open it up to any questions. Go ahead and uh, raise your hands, and I can go ahead and unmute you. There's seven in the chat. Let's see here. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay, I'll go ahead and just start from the top. Um, Okay, um, from, from an anonymous attendee in my homeless experience and dealing with agencies, the agencies that had lower caseloads with case managers seemed to be able to direct and refer places. And I was able to get these services such as housing, SUD and um, mental health services. Looks like that's just a comment. Well, I think it, uh, it, it and I think, you know, that makes a, a, a lot of sense. It's like a lower class size, much better for um, the learning experience. But I, I will say, you, you know, this is where we all come in. This is where we advocate through the Office of, of Homeless Services. This is where we advocate one-on-one -on -one with legislators. And everyone on the panel today and everyone listening Please remember that every single one of you has the power within you to influence your legislature, whether it be a senator or a representative, whether it be a commissioner, what an elected official is responsible for their constituents. And we're all constituents. So you need to talk to your legislators. You've lived the experience and you're speaking from first hand. You're listening to them first and then saying, may I add, and then talk about your personal experience. Keep it short and concise and succinct and have a piece of paper with bullets on it and the statements so they have something uh, to take away. But everybody has the power within them to make a difference. Do any of the panel disagree, please? No? No, I would, and I would add, don't forget city councils, yes, city council course. members, mayors, commissioners, right. and then your state legislators, but you're absolutely right. We as elected officials are responsible to our constituencies. And I think it's really important we put a face to homelessness so that it doesn't become the homeless, this nameless person out there. It's very important that uh, elected officials 
have that experience so that they can see that we are the face of homelessness, right? Um, when I get people in, when I get people that come and try to advocate to me that say, I don't want those type of housing projects in my neighborhood, it doesn't phase me because I was those types of housing projects, right? And so I think the more that our elected leaders see the face of homelessness and they see us, then they'll realize that um, there's more to be done. That, oh, oh, so well said. Um, so Jack, Shaley, and Brian, how about you appearing before legislators and, and telling some of your story? And um, I, I guarantee that many of them will listen. Many of them have learned from other people who have been homeless. So let's make that a, a, a goal for this next session. And uh, what was the next question, please? Uh, yeah, um, just really quickly, I wanted to let everybody know that there's about, uh, at this point, three minutes. So just three minute warning for everybody. Okay. Um, it looks like, uh, okay, here we have a question. What are ways that case managers can better build trust with clients, especially when clients may have been let down by service providers in the past? Shaley. Thank you. Um, I do feel that um, it's not only important to listen, but it's also important to think about some of the resources that they are telling you that they need um, and making an effort to try and connect them to those resources. Uh, I know it's very difficult when case managers are so overloaded, um, but even the, the people working at the shelter have access to those resources and they can help out as well. Um, there's also many different um, partners that they work with that can also provide resources to individuals who are facing homelessness. And so I do think it's important um, that we connect them with those resources so that they can feel more confident in your ability to help them overcome homelessness. Well said, yeah. Let's, I'm, and I'm seeing some nods. Let's go on to the next question, if we may. Let's see, there are a couple of comments. Kelly Romner would, wanted to, she said, I need to make a correction. I am a client liaison with Salt Lake County Aging Services, not the director, oh, smiley face. Sure. <laughs> um, let's see, I have, there's a couple of comments from, it looks like case managers working in the field. I am a case manager at the Women's Shelter in Salt Lake. I agree with many of the points made. I am especially glad that we are more lenient on paraphernalia in the shelters. It has provided an opportunity to help those struggling with substance use. I wish that we had more peer support specialists at the shelters. They are very helpful in building trust with clients. I have followed the peer support practices in my style of case management, and it has helped me build trust with clients. That's great to hear. Mm -hmm. And then one other comment, as a case manager, I appreciate the opportunity for this training we are receiving from these folks who have experienced homelessness and are giving us true experiences to learn from. Thank you so much. I just much. wanted to add one thing really quick. I mean, if you look at Stephen Covey's The Speed of Trust, one of the things that he talks about is if you wanna gain trust with someone, to be vulnerable with them as well. And so uh, if you're sitting down, identify personally with them. If they're having a problem in an area that you have any personal experience, open yourself up because they're not willing to open themselves up to you because they don't know if they can. And if you open yourself up to them, show some vulnerability, then that will show them that they, you trust them and therefore they will trust yeah. you. So it's a reciprocal thing. Oh, that is well said indeed. I couldn't have said it any better. I, I, we're at time now. I would like to thank the panelists and um, for your courage in, in speaking out. And uh, to all the audience, thank you for participating and thank you for your comments. And this is only a beginning. I'll, I'll say that again. There are going to be many more conversations like this and um, you will all be heard from again but I appreciate your honesty and frankness. And let us hear of any other comments that our audience has. And thank you for joining us on Zoom. It's been my honor to be the moderator with these incredible people today. Thank you all so much.
Thank you, well, Pamela. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pamela, and thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Okay. Well, Thanks. Thank you. I'm the only one still there. <laughs> mm -hmm.